Hello, everybody. Thank you for listening in today. I'm thrilled to have Nathan Woods joining us today. Nathan heads up marketing and brand at the Bolt Farm Treehouse. It's an amazing mountaintop retreat that creates space for guests to rest, reconnect with nature, their loved ones, their purpose. Uh, Nathan has a rich background in the direct-to-consumer and CPG realms, and notably with his groundbreaking work at RunGum. We're going to get into that in our conversation. Um, he's really mastered the art of building consumer connections and driving brand growth through direct engagement, something so important to hospitality, of course. Um, Nathan's here to share some really valuable insights on the shift uh, in trends in how consumers engage with companies, with brands, um, and how this all fits into hospitality. So with that being said, Nathan, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with us today. Oh, th thanks so much for letting me join. I Humbled to be even here, as you see a lot of your past guests and hear my humble, been in the industry for a year, um, but excited to share what I've, what I've learned and what, what we're doing and what I'm doing. And just, very, yeah, thank you for letting me be part of this. I've been looking forward to it. And I want to get into your, your whole journey, but just to set the stage, maybe just let's um, tell our listeners that are maybe unfamiliar with the brand. Tell us a little bit more about Bull Farm Treehouse and what your role there is there today. Then I'd love to get into the story of how you got there. Yeah, it, we're we're a really, really unique space, and you know we're kind of in that mixture of luxury and glamping, and that's popped up a lot in the last you know five eight years. Um, the backstory, um, again, a cool, very cool story is Seth Bolt. Um, he is. A founding member of a rock band called Need to Breathe. He's the basis for that for that band. Currently, actually, on, on, on a really big tour, um, he built an original treehouse on his parents' farm in Wahala, South Carolina, for his honeymoon, for his wedding. And it, it was at that during that honeymoon and that at, during that wedding season, that moment that him and his wife Tori got to kind of experience a tree house and, and, and experience that slow down, experience that rest. And they just uh, decided in that moment to, that's what they wanted to do. And you kind of wonder like, how can you do more than what you're already doing? But they, they kind of went on the path to pursue that. And so um, that started with short-term rentals, building a few more, building some more on in Charleston, South Carolina. And then that's what ultimately led over the course of a few years, buying this, an amazing piece of property outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, where we currently have 13 or 50 acres on this cliffside overlooking the valley. And we're a unique, like I said, in that, in that mixture of um, glamping meets luxury. And you kind of said it, we are a resort with luxurious accommodations and truly cloud nine views that invite our guests to rest and reconnect with nature, as you said, with their loved ones, with their purpose. And whether they're coming to celebrate life's biggest moments, we've hosted well over a thousand anniversaries, over 500 birthdays and growing number of proposals and elopements and, and all that. Like whether they're coming for those biggest moments of their lives or they're needing a place to truly rest from the craziness they're going through some of the hardest times we invite that space and and we provide that environment so they can get that time to reflect and grieve and our team sets that up so they can experience that so it's um still you know we're fast growing we have big expansion plans for 2024 just in the property that we have in tennessee we, right now we have 19 property 19 accommodations between tree houses geomestic drones and mirror cabins which at the time were the first in the u.s um have next in the next year we'll be building more tree houses expanding into more of a from a short-term rental type space to a true resort with food and beverage and spa and a lot more experiences so a lot of growth a lot of needs for more people to come join us what we're doing both remotely and on the property um so we're, we're kind of getting set up to hi go through a big hiring phase and people find people that want to join us in creating these experiences for guests well, maybe to get into that, I would love to hear about your own journey into hospitality because you have not spent your whole career in hospitality, uh, but you decided to focus on this as you know your next, uh, you know this next chapter of your career. You're, you're building here, you're creating things in the world of hospitality. But let's rewind the clock for a little bit of context and talk about some of the roles and experiences that you had in in business, um, and as, as a way to kind of set that up and how you transitioned into hospitality. Yeah, it, it's funny when you, it's been 
And you can look back in 10 years and be like, oh, this is obviously the path for your life. But in the moment, you're like, I would have never guessed this is where I was headed. Um, I, funny enough, got, I was, so my first job out of college, which was in that 2009, not the greatest time to leave college, look for jobs. Um, went to work for a heavy equipment machinery brand that, that housed different different bigger brands and went to work for like sales training. But since there was not a need for sales, it was basically driving truck parts around the state of Oregon. And I, that's in a, other side. No, I'm based in Oregon properties in Tennessee that I work for now. But, um, and in that you just kind of, you know, I had one of you know, those moments where you're just in a car by yourself for hours. And, and I, and I, that's where I came to the first conclusion like this. I, and I probably wouldn't have put the term hospitality out on it yet, but like what I love to do is create, experiences and opportunities for people to experience joy for me at that time that was like i need to get into events and sports I, i'm here in eugene oregon track town usa and i was like well the olympic trials are coming up in a couple of years and this is back 2011 and through that and then a pursuit of a, a master's degree in sports hospitality um that was kind of my first taste in hospitality i didn't see it as hospitality as we talk now and what i'm doing now but that uh, that idea of like just creating the space for people to come escape or be entertained was the idea. Um, so, so I started with, that was kind of my first taste, did that for a few years, hosting the world's biggest track and field events or bidding for um, the world's biggest track and field events here in the United States. Before I even left, I was part of kind of the bidding that eventually led to the last year we actually hosted the world championships here in the United States in little Eugene, Oregon. And so that was my first taste in hospitality, but through that garnered relationships with people. Um, I okay. wonder before, if we, we go any further, if I um, could just ask a follow-up about that, because like you say, maybe it's not traditional hospitality, but hospitality at its core is, you know, thinking about people, how do you create these moments, these yeah. experiences for people? I'm curious in that world of sports and, and, and live events, is there anything that stood out to you early on or now reflecting back on that in terms of what creates these really kind of peak experiences for people in that world of sports and lives of live events? People go to sports and spend an ungodly amount of money to either because they're big fans of, of their team or that sport. And so often like that's what they look forward to, whether it's, you know, we're in the middle of football season, the amount of people that they live for Saturday mornings, college football or live for Sunday. Like that is what they live their weekends for. And, and I think the other part of that is so many of us did them as kids growing up. And so you have that passion for that sport. Um, how, my involvement in there was like the VIP hospitality. So even more like, Hey, I'm providing the space for important people, CEOs of big shoe companies and, and thing like that. And so I think the thing I learned the most was the importance still in that moment, like of, welcoming people in and the experience that they have from the moment they walk into the gate and, you know, sports athletic programs and sports teams, they put so much emphasis on the, the guest experience and the entertainment that they provide from the moment they're like walking into the stadium. And I mean, obviously yeah, not thinking about it then, but looking back now, like the, the effort and energy they put into cur making sure the, st the people entertain, because they're, that's an entertainment business as much as they're there to watch their favorite team in the, it's about the players winning or, you know, competing. It's an entertainment business and they have, they have to do the job of entertaining. Um, but I, I just got to see that from my, like, I think the experience I drew out of that was the importance of paying attention and, and the importance of like, even like now some of the things that we do now is like I had world junior championships back in 2014. We had binders with every guest in the VIP hospitality with their faces and their names. And like, we had to pay attention to that much detail because they wanted to be greeted by their name. And, and, you know, I don't always have to deal with guests that have that kind of level of needs, but just some of those little things of like, but how much more welcoming it is to know people's name when they're walking in the door or know some of their favorite things or know the food or the drink that they want to have when you, they sit down in their seats. And those are things that we did back then that now it's like, well, we're doing some of those things now here on the property here in Tennessee. So I yeah. appreciate you breaking that down because I think sometimes people in hospitality think they, they're only looking at other hospitality businesses or experiences. And the reality is the people that we're serving have their expectations set in the world of live events and sports and all these other 
context and mm-hmm. then bringing that to the hospitality property. So it's really important to think about what does creating those peak, mom- peak moments look like? What does it look like to make someone feel special? Um, and it's cool to see you tie that thread from earlier in your career to the work that you do today. Yeah, I mean, we were, I was talking to our team about just that that binder the other day of just how can we replicate that without being creepy, obviously. You don't want to be creepy too much, but um, it, it just having that like resource of like, here's what, this is how you can welcome people in a way that's different um, and it has it can have a huge impact has been, yeah. That's one, that's one thing I did to ever have taken from that world. I love it. So from there, you moved into the world of direct consumer, I understand, right? And um, within the world of entrepreneurship and starting companies, I feel like direct consumer DTC has been very, very hot recently, yeah. but you've been at this for a while. I'd love if you could speak a little bit to that experience, um, because I think there's some lessons here that we can also take into the world of hospitality. Yeah, on uh, the high level, it was a company called Rungam. I, I, it was founded by a runner's coach who I connected with through that previous job of working in track and field. And I was employee number one. So I was like, here, we're launching a company that we know no idea what we're doing. Kind of, can you go figure it out? And, you know, that was in kind of that 2013, 2014. Um, I won't say it was this. It was during kind of that still heyday of early where you're just seeing all these different consumer brands just launch, 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 because it was easy. You had a couple of ecosystems that said, here's a site, you can put your product on there. Social media was still super organic. You could just post about it, share about it, and you could grow grow a small little company like that um, and grow it into a big company. We did that. We started as a small Shopify-based business. We grew, doubled, 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 started going to retail, and then eventually we got into Target, Walmart, Nationwide, which the product still sits on those shelves. Um, in packaging, and I think the other thing that I think one of the things that starting a company and being in that phase of the industry that has greatly helped me now with this younger brand of Bolt Farm Trios is the willingness and the nimbleness to wear many hats and, and to learn and be scrappy to get either design done or build out your marketing funnels, create emails to be in the DMs and engaging with your potential customers, seeing like every comment is, hey, this is a potential customer here that I'm commenting back to. Um, all of that. And then seeing the whole process of like, I remember engaging this person on DMs. I remember them signing up for me an email. And now I'm sitting in the warehouse packing up their box and shipping out the door. Um, I think just being part of that entire journey and seeing the impact the entire journey can have, like on a very granular level, um, it's definitely stuff that as we're in a still, I mean, I would say startup, but definitely a fast growing, small hospitality brand. We still have the luxury to some level to be part of that entire process and have very few people a part of that entire process. So it's like, we actually can do a lot of the little direct consumer things that have that grew direct consumer so fastly in the hospitality space. Um, I think that's really special. I I just want to underscore that point because I think regardless of the size of company you're at, if you're at a smaller company or individual property, wearing those multiple hats actually can be very cool and meaningful, right? I think for the same reason that you mentioned in this other industry, this other context, I was talking to somebody the other day that talked about this innkeeper mentality. And you think about the old classic Mm. bed and breakfast where you're the person answering the phone, making the reservation, greeting them, maybe making breakfast in the morning. And there's something about seeing that whole thing where if you're only in a very specific functional area, you lose, it, it's easy to lose sight of, you know, why do, why do we do all this? Or, you know, kind of what is the impact on people? And so I think maybe, especially for, maybe if you're an executive or a leader at a larger company, it'd be interesting to think about, is there a way where you can expose people that are working in a narrow functional area, either mm-hmm. through rotational work or um, somehow helping them see the impact of the specific thing they're doing on the person you're serving, right? And I think that's important to close the loop there. Yeah, and I think when you get to that granular level of engaging with your a pro- prospective guest or customer to they've booked and they're it's pre arrival like I don't know for at least for me personally like getting in that granular level makes you realize it's not just IP address on your site it's not just reservation number X Y Z it's like no this is a human this is an individual who's gone to the effort pulled out their pocketbook and is letting is giving it to you. And I have this sign right above my desk and I've had it since I started the other company. It says, 
never forget your customers pay your salary. And back then it was like the company was mine. So that was for sure. But like, even in this environment, like they're the ones that allow me to do what I get to do. Not in, I know you can get into the world of investing and all that, but like, it's ultimately the guests that are paying the salary and that humbleness and seeing it through that whole journey. I think the, that take every, like all the granular being in the weeds of the direct consumer and get it up in the clouds. I think that's the, the thing that I learned most about that decade plus in direct consumer is just how powerful it is to engage a guest on a one-to-one -one level and, and building a community from the one-to-ones to minis within direct consumer and just the importance of that direct communication, direct engagement, direct community building within your tribe of your guests and your customers. I mean, I would have ambassador groups and community groups and customer advisory groups in this small direct consumer brand because they were the ones that were going to be telling people about us and, and help, helping us grow. How'd you get started with that? I love that idea. The what one? The, the, in, in, like the, whether it's a, a customer advisory group or an ambassador program, any of those elements, I'm, I'm really curious about community building in the context of building a business. It, it started for us, I mean, on, you know, on a marketing level of like, Hey, people are in a, a social perspective to level like, Hey, if we build a community and they share it. And it's really easy when it was like a, you know, $2 product to send samples to people and say, hey, share this with, with individuals. But through that, we also wanted them to represent the, represent the brand if we we're going to give them the opportunity. And the thing that I find so interesting, especially when you go into social perspective, but you can add it for communities, people do want to engage with the products they buy. Like I, no doubt about it to my mind. Like, and they feel when you extend that invite to them, like, hey, we see you, we want you to be just a part of what we're doing, whether it's in a private community or an ambassador role or an affiliate role, however, they get excited because not too many people get an invitation to be part of a brand or, um, and all that. And so from my experience, like the amount of excited people that were just, Hey, we're in a private Facebook group. It's not much more than that, but you're part of it. They take a lot of pride in that. And that from a marketing perspective is phenomenal because then they're sharing the brand to their entire community whether that's, you know, in that world running and sports in a very, you know, niche world there. But that I, I just, people, I think we take it for granted, like how much people like that. I mean, we all want to feel wanted and needed and having a brand do that with an individual, I think has a great impact. So that that's really fascinating to me. And I feel like, um, you know, people use the word community in a lot of different contexts and it has value in a lot of different contexts. I think there's the mm -hmm. the personal friendships we have, there's the environments we're in, there's these digital communities, um, you know, and, and so there's there's so many, you know, layers to this onion. Um, I am, so you talk about building customer advisory boards, ambassador programs, all this kind of stuff. Um, you also, you know, built your TikTok uh, account to, uh, you know, 750,000 plus followers, I believe. Um, we're recording this in 2023. I want this to be valuable, you know, for years and years to come. I think yeah. my question is less about the tactic of the platform, but how did you think about, I guess, scaling, you know, your ability to reach and engage people, you know, in this case through TikTok to so many people? And, and this is the, a pretty hard stance belief on this is that social media is for engagement and not posting. And so the level of engagement and the level of content and the type of content, for me, it, it's not engagement versus beautiful and sexy and represents the brand perfectly. It's not like either or, but it's definitely, I'd take engagement over sexy photos or sexy, re, you know, image or video or well-produced instead, if you don't want to use sexy, well-produced, like you can, I mean, I made these plenty of mistakes and I think hospitality makes a lot of these mistakes as we spend so much money in making the perfect video or the perfect shot you post it no one wants to see it or engage with it so it's not going to get any love from the algorithm and so what's the point of even doing it at that point like and those platforms whether it's tiktok or instagram or facebook any of them they're built for engagement and they're built for comments and talking and all that and so i just have a heart there's a really hard stance that like you need to be engaging over everything in that platform. So the type of content, like you need to think of content that's actually going to get engagement, whether that's likes, comments, shares, not, Hey, it looks pretty and it fits the brand. Yeah. If you can do both, that's phenomenal, but it's, 
and the level in which then I've always, whether it's me, myself, the teams that I've hired, like the amount of time we just spend in the comments, engaging with our brand, engaging with other people's brands, engaging with creators and just being in the platform and talking and engaging and starting the conversation, given the type, you know, fit, fitting in it within whatever the specific platform. That's how I found, you know, most success. And, you know, I, again, you could see sales happen from a direct consumer standpoint. And, you know, that still happens, you know, Bolt Farm, I think feel like they had a pl great platform when I joined it, but that's still kind of the emphasis is like engagement over sexy. I feel like you're my long last brother because <laughs> so many people see it differently. And uh, I'm obsessed with ability to create conversations. And, um, and so it's just a, a different orientation, right? And I think kind of by thinking of things that way, um, Hospitality Daily has more engagement than any other hospitality media brand because, you know, there's these great companies as good people, but they have like whole teams of people in production and everything honestly looks really good. And for me, it's just me, right? It's just me and having conversations, trying to facilitate conversations. People start talking. And I think a takeaway that I've seen building Hospitality Daily, you've seen building these companies is that that's kind of how you win. That's where you get traction. That's where you get a very engaged group of people, right? It's not about just looking super polished well, all the time, right? Yeah. I mean, if we all scroll, whatever platform we're scrolling and how often do you see the algorithm just favor a boring image of a product or a boring image of a hotel room? It's never that. It's super engaging reels. It's super engaging creator type stuff. It's the media. Like sometimes I base myself, what's ESPN doing? Because they got a million comments on the thing. It's just like, well, kind of how can I copy or mimic some of their, I think one of the best posts Bolt Farm has had was I mimicked a, an image of basically a kind of like a story headline that you would see from E! Online. And that's like been our, one of our best like static images. And so it's looking at the ones that get engagement, knowing that like uh, people engage with that type of content. And I know, I know, I mean, there's times when, you know, you look at things and you're like, that looks great. It has zero comments, like, or has 10 likes. Like, what was the point? Like, and I challenge myself and I challenge our team. Like, what was the point of posting it or posting that type of content if it's not going to get anything? And so when it came to like growing TikTok back then, it was, we're just going to repeat some videos often. We're going to share, we're going to, we are posting three to four or five times a day um, and repeating stuff three weeks later, if it had a great engagement and great, you know, went kind of viral, just let's try it again, repost it because there's a whole new audience that might see it. And so not being afraid to do some of that and, and share the same thing we've shared 10 times um, because for whatever reason, the algorithm, our followers, the community within that found it interesting and engaged with it. And then that was what opened the door for big growth. I think your growth story there is really fascinating to me because you're not only building community, you're leveraging cutting edge digital platforms like TikTok, but you're also thinking about key partnership and key relationships, right? So you talked about the product being on the stores of Target and Walmart nationwide, right? In incredible distribution. What did you learn through that process about identifying and putting together these key partnerships that are going to scale the business to the next level? And I'd be lied to you if I said, hey, it was very strategic and we went and hammered these guys and it was just super simple. Um, or I was super, you know, got beat up in all these meetings and things like that. I think us focusing so long in, in establishing that direct consumer part of it and, and building our social and building our brand and having that platform made it really easy for them to like, oh, yeah, we like your product. And you have a much bigger following than they, this competitor brand. So you're going to send people into our stores. Um, you know, I think that was, that was a part of it. We hit, you know, kind of a right time with the right product, um, with what some of these bigger stores were wanting to do to expand into more nutritional sports, nutrition products. Um, and then we were able to have the right conversations with the right people. Um, kind of similar to the world I'm in now with, with Bolt Farm and having a CEO founder who has a different life. Like I, my the founder that and the CEO of Run Gum was an Olympic runner with a big following. And so you get them to the, you get them into the room and 
people are going to be like, hey, I was a fan of you. Okay, I'm going to bring you your product. But it still took the them how to see the proof of product and see that we are going to drive people into your store because we have a direct relationship with them over here. We have you know this many followers and email list of you know hundreds of thousands. When we send an email, people are going to go into your store and buy it. And we're going to send people your way. And for those big retailers, like they want to know, like what are you going to do to sell the product on the shelf? It's not their job; it's your job to get the product off the shelf. And so, but we, that wouldn't have happened if we didn't have done what we had done for the six years, seven years prior of building an audience and building a list and owning those relationships. And I think that's kind of the big thing now in the direct booking world is owning the relationship versus waiting for them to come on. And hopefully they maybe sign up for your web Wi-Fi so you can start having that direct relationship. Like owning the relationship allows you to do so much more when you need, when you need to pull the trigger. I want to get into the world of hospitality, but just one more follow up to this. You were employee number one at this direct to consumer brand. Um, and then you've talked about parallels of, you know, working for a high profile founder CEO in that context and also uh, what you're doing now at Bolt. My question for you is, what have you learned about being effective um, as an early employee working, you know, for a high uh, profile person? Because I think there's a lot of people that listen to this that are maybe not the founder of their company, but they're working closely with that person. And I think it is a very underrated role. I, I spent seven years uh, working for a founding CEO too, and you get to see a lot. I'm curious what you've seen or advice that you'd have having done this and, and you are doing this now in, in what it takes to be effective in, in that capacity. And, and I won't say I've always done it well, like on an individual basis. Um, I think there's that part, just DNA and ability to just want to be help you know you don't have as you don't have too much ego that you're not willing to help some, build someone else's vision and dream and i think that's something i've always been fine with like yeah i can have my own dreams but i can also step alongside and do that depending on the size of the company you know i kind of mentioned it like if you don't have a willingness or tolerance towards change and being nimble when something's different then it's really hard to be in an environment of a small company. Like, cause whether it's the founder CEO decides to shift vision or economically something has to change, or you're seeing growth over here with this different type of product or different type of campaign. Like, and, and if you don't, if you're not willing or can't like move through those very well, then it's really hard to be in those environments when things are constantly changing. Um, and, and then two, I think the, the last part is like, you know, whether it was, his name was Nick Simmons. He's phenomenal. He became a YouTuber. He's got massive YouTube following now. Um, making sure for me, like making sure the founders like is allowing themselves to still do the things that like makes them fired up. Like Seth, like trying to like be like, oh, I don't have enough time for Seth here at Bolt Farm. And then, you know, like, and trying to like, he needs to be here more and get better that he's not around. Like, no, he needs to be, doing what he's doing, making music, playing around the world. One, that helps us because he's around the world talking about Bolt Farm Trios. But then two, that gets what, that's what fires him up and gets him moot, his excitement going and his joy complete so that he can then be the leader and visionary that he needs to be Bolt Farm Trios. And that was the same at running. I'm like, I need a Nick to either be running and when he's tired, I need him to be making YouTube videos because that's what got him so excited about coming to work every day. And then we fill the team or fill the the things that they aren't able to accomplish every day for the sake of the company. And so whether it's adding to the team or taking on different parts that they're able to do. But those are the kind of the two things I found similar to a lot of ways is, you know, they're they're in their spaces for a reason. They're very they just they have that drive and that desire to be successful. And when you've reached the the heights that they have in two different worlds, like the amount of drive you have to be there to get to that level and sustain it for as long as they have. Nick was a professional runner for you know, 10 ish years. And Seth's been playing high level band uh, music for almost 20 years now. And to sustain it, that takes a level of thing that you just want, you want it to continue and you don't want it to dry up. And so creating those spaces so they can do that. I think it's just really important. I love it. I want to talk a little bit about how you transitioned into hospitality. What was the opportunity that you saw? You were building these amazing companies. Um, what attracted you to hospitality? I think it goes back just the the core of what I know is more in alignment of my heart. Um, there's that one, like, um, 
you know, my wife and I have said for the longest time, like kind of our mission for our family. You can you can't really read it, but it's right right up there. It says um, to provide hospitality with our home and our hearts. So that's kind of been like our course. So like the idea of hospitality. I don't know if it's going to be able to be readable there, but um, that's a basic way. You you've actually wrote this out and you framed it. It's well, a little hard to see in the camera, yeah. but that's amazing. And so it's just been like for us, how we want to live our life is being hospitable and being welcoming. And that is far different from the industry of hospital. I don't say it's far different, but they're, they're different things. It like can the industry be, of, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The industry of hospitality versus the heart of hospitality. And I had the heart of hospitality without really understanding. And this going back to like the 10 year, how to have this happen. It starts, I was a big fan of Need to Breathe, the band, going back to like 20, 2006. So I've been following them, going to concerts, following, you know, their follow, their the members as they kind of had their own social things. Um, so that that's kind of step one. And then about the same time, Seth started building his original treehouse um, down South Carolina and posting about it and sharing about it. My dad and his brothers and kind of me were building a not quite the same level treehouse, but a treehouse on the Southern Oregon coast. So kind of following along of like, Hey, he's building a treehouse. I'm building a treehouse. I remember really funny story. I went to a concert um, for need to breathe back 2015, 2014 and got, got kind of some access to the VIP and like having that conversation with Seth, like, Hey, I'm building a treehouse. You're building a treehouse. No, obviously no idea what's going to happen eight years later where I was going to um, start working for it. Um, but you can look back and be like, man, it was just a collision that was starting back eight years ago. And the start of 2022, man, just whenever you're in a, I mean, startups are hard and eight, you know, a decade plus into it roughly, I was just starting to feel kind of that wear of being in that. And, you know, for whatever reason, started reading books on hospitality, both whether it's community idea of hospitality to industry hospitality, just started reading books. And, you know, I think it, you, you look at that how that collision of me just wanting to start to read books. And then my wife's desire to see, follow Bolt Farm Treehouse and, and on Instagram, like, I want to go there and following their posts about, Hey, we're hiring kind of led to me like putting my name in there, but not really expecting much, not really thinking I even wanted to leave what I was doing at the time. Um, but eventually kind of got to that spot where my family and I decided it was time for maybe a little change. And, Tori had reached out to me on email and we kind of connected for over the course of a month to just kind of go back and forth. Like, does this make sense for you guys to hire someone like me? Does it make sense for me to, you know, join the team of what you guys. And after that conversation, we just felt like it was, was an, an intriguing and curious like move for both of us to, for them to bring in a direct consumer guy into a, a hospitality brand that was majority of direct booking at the time already. Um, and then me to kind of finally take that leap into, Hey, I want to, I need to do something different, whether it's for refreshing my career, not like for stance, but just refreshing my like, excitement to go to work every day uh, and, and going into what I know is an, an alignment of the heart. Like I made gum at times as a marketer sound like it was life changing, right? Like you do that as marketers. We have to like put this like persona that your product is going to greatly impact someone's life and it can have an impact on someone's life. Being in hospitality for, for as long as like, I know the experiences that we create for our guests, often couples, has a huge impact. And so just like the marketer in me is like, man, it's so much easier to wake up and market and be excited about the the weeds of marketing, building funnels and creating these, all these data things, knowing that it is actually having an impact versus a product that's, yeah, it's a good product. It worked. People liked it. But it's, I don't know. They're, they're, yeah. So that, that's kind of the the full story there is like, Moving into an alignment of a hospitable heart makes it my job and coming to my job a lot easier. I love that and appreciate you sharing your story. I think it's really special when you find that alignment between things that you really care about and how you're able to spend your time, right? And use your uh, your skills, what you've learned over your career in, in service of that. I'm always fascinated to hear from people who are coming from outside the hospitality industry, what their first impressions are or opportunities they see in the world of hospitality. As you mentioned, there's the notion of hospitality. That's a very big, beautiful concept. Sometimes the industry of hospitality doesn't necessarily live up to the ideals and all the potential there. Um, you know, you are running highly sophisticated marketing programs, community building, you know, partnerships, all these different things. You enter the world of hospitality and this is your full-time gig now. What are some of the first things that stood out to you 
about opportunities or things that you're most excited about building in this new context where, where you are now? Yeah, I mean, I think the big difference in mindset was how do you go from selling a $20 product online to, you know, a couple hundred dollar, a few hundred dollar night per stay accommodation. And so the mindset of understanding the journey on how long it takes, like I could get people to book in an instant for a $20 product, but understanding like it's going to take a little bit longer for someone to commit. Now we get the occasional people find us on Instagram and they book two seconds later, but that journey was a big kind of like needing to understand but also having to be a little more patient, like, hey, this is going to be a journey and you're not going to see the same level of type of analytics that you're normally seeing from a marketing and um, MER and our RO, you know, return on ad spend. So understanding that, and I'm, I'm still to say like, it's still, that's still, I'm like, my mind's still like at times, like this should be a lot easier. It should be a lot faster. Um, the thing that was like the most shocking and like, oh man, this is a lot harder than I thought was, the convolution of the tech stack that we have in hospitality and that like there isn't this and it's all connected to this like direct consumer i mean it is shopify yeah maybe a couple others but it is shopify and everybody's building these very guest i'm say i'm already the good thing is i'm saying guest now instead of customer um but got customer engaging apps whether it's for loyalty or all this stuff and it's just, well, if you're that building that's easy you plug in shopify you're set in hospitality, it's like, that's a lot harder because there's so many different PMSs. There's so many RMSs and not one property is using, it's not like we're all flocking to one. We're all like all over the place. You can't click on 10 properties and see 10 of the same system, especially from the booking engine and PMS. And I think that's made it difficult for, and, and you can understand why the the push towards direct booking is so hard because the systems to be able to do all the things that you do in direct consumer are just not easily con connected I, I mean you can do it but it's not seamless like you, you know direct consumers had for a decade now and you know I, you know i've been pulling as much direct consumer apps into the world of hospitality and having and having these conversations with some of these platforms like yeah hey, like we haven't touched hospitality it's like oh, i'm gonna give it a shot um just because that's do you have an I example mean. of that that you've, you've kind of used from the world of consumer i mean our email kind of system's not built for hospitality um but okay. i'm making it work we utilize um a postcard automation postcard system that's very direct consumer CPG that I've, I'm making work automation, sending postcards at different points of the journey, abandoned carts, post checkout, things like that. Um, that being wildly successful, not crazy integrated, but I can tell wildly successful. Um, the, the different ways we use video, I think, is another one that you're seeing you see direct consumer use, especially on an on site perspective to engage and do quizzes to get really more information about the guest wants you. I don't have to see it. You'll see it on our site, Bolt Country House. Yes. Like we have a video that is a quiz to get an idea of what the guest is most looking for. Hey, they want a tree house in the winter with their spouse for a romantic thing. And then what we can do from that, from a marketing perspective, automation wise is way more impactful if we just said, Hey, what's your email? Um, things like wait, that. That's that, wait, they hold up. That, that's, that's super interesting. So you're, you're, it's not just kind of like, here's what we have. You're, you're immediately engaging people and trying to get a sense of what they're looking for so that you can communicate. Here's what we, well, I guess you can get a sense of you're a fit, right? And if you are yeah. a fit, you can communicate more effectively. Yeah. And I, this is my naiveness a little bit to the world. It's like, I don't know. I'm sure that's being done at some level in hospitality. As you go independent boutique, probably less, but that's what direct consumer, like you want to know what products they're interested in buying. And, and then you want to know why they want to buy those products. And, and so bringing in some of those ideas, you know, the quiz, direct consumer quizzes got really hot there, like in the COVID time of like, just you just saw everybody in direct consumer was doing some form of quiz and then would give you an algorithm based product recommendation. Um, it was really big in makeup and sports nutrition and all these things. And I had done it previously as well. And so that was one of the first things we implemented was a quiz. We did it through video because you know, we have kind of faces of the company that made it super engaging. And then, yeah, instead of the first email being very generic, it's like, Hey, you want to come in the winter and stay in the treehouse for your anniversary? Sweet. And we can start providing the right messages to the guests versus, you know, just very generic information. Why well, there's so many different elements, obviously to hospitality technology and data within hospitality. Obviously there's a big operational component. There's big revenue management mm -hmm. component. I think, um, 
I'm curious with your, you know, background, your expertise in marketing, um, you know, kind of how you're thinking about data and gathering. Is there any other um, kind of, I guess, like what else is on your mind in terms of, of collecting and using data to be relevant and communicate in an engaging way with, with your guests or prospective guests? Yeah, I think I still find it interesting and I'm still learning. I would say it's interesting because it's still something I'm having to learn and understand completely. But much of the hospitality focused on a PMS and focused on, you know, occupancy and room rates and all this and, and, and all this data over here. And, and what kind of interesting to me is it was never about the guests. It was about the rooms versus like, you know, you go to platforms and direct consumer. It's like, what is the lifetime value? What is the return customer rate? What is all these things that are very guest facing? How many products bought this, but not this? How many products didn't buy this, but they added this to their cart at the very end? Those are the data that I was spending so much of my time on. I wasn't spending time too much on like, you know, product cost of this and that, and that part of it. But it was more like, what is this data around the guest? And at least in, you know, in my short year, it's like getting that kind of information has been much harder than, yeah, I can pull up my ADR in a half a second. I can pull up my occupancy and my rev par and all those things really quickly. But like to get like some of this very like, I need to understand my guests better. That one's taken a lot more of like, I need to connect this system to this system and then kind of pull this report and plug it into here versus just being able to see it. And there might be systems out there. If you are, let me know. <laughs> but that, that's been the like most interesting when it came to data is it's more centered around rooms and all that, which is super important. But I'm coming from a direct consumer. It's like, I want to know everything about my my customer and, and what this cohort of customers look like. Like people that come during this season, how much more likely are they to come back and how long does it take for them to rebook? And getting that kind of data has been a lot harder to just easily grab and understand and it would be super helpful. I think it's super helpful. Like, so it's trying to like think of like, how does the hospitality sh- if they go as they want to go more as you know you're hearing everybody talk about how do we go you need to go direct booking direct booking direct booking. how do we shift that like all right then your hub needs to be your guest not a pms if that makes that's kind of again this is my, my outside brain thinking about it of like it needs to be a like that needs to be the hub and the pms is a feature of it versus the main part right the guest does need to be the hub i mean that is hospitality at its core right so technology should be a support of that if it, that's the orientation i think we need to provide great service to uh, be effective in, in hospitality. And I think um, I like hearing that, you know, whether it comes from outside the industry or within, it doesn't matter. Like hospitality is about the people that we're serving, right? Um, you know, Nathan, you know, I think I, as we're- the other, yeah. I guess the one other part on the technology, like when it comes to as well, is like the ability to, yes, market and get commerce from it, but from a guest perspective and, and not like how does it fit within the room perspective. Um, you know, I think direct consumer, you saw the ability to- how you can upsell and how you can find other products to add into their cart. So their cart value is way more, you know, that, that world of direct consumer and the post, the pre post checkout to create add ons. Like it's in there in hospitality, but it's, again, it's not like a, a major focus or the features aren't consistent through all the different platforms to make it easy for, especially independent hotels to like, Hey, we're going to add these add ons or these upsells or these other product ideas that can, increase brand loyalty, increase conversion, increase ultimate commerce and dollars, right, as well, while still being focused on the guests. Love it. I love it. You know, we're recording this um, towards the end of 2023. As you look into 2024 and beyond, I'm curious what themes or trends uh, are top of mind for you right now that you're excited by, that you're looking into, where you see my, there might be some opportunity in, in the world of hospitality. Well, I know the industry it's into this direct booking, which, you know, I think we, and obviously AI and there's some, I I don't even jump into AI. It's powerful. I use it daily. I don't know exactly how it's going to work and look, but, um, how do you use it daily? Oh, getting into that. um, (laughs) We get, we could also skip. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about it. I mean, I use it for creating marketing ideas, creating marketing language, yeah. Um, from like a, just a language based chat AI, like chat, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're starting to implement it, uh, and, and train so we can utilize it on our site instead of having like a boring FAQ, just have our own, um, AI kind of chat widget. Um, 
different from like, a, I guess not chat, but at least like FAQ does they can, people can yeah. ask whatever question will be in, in that. Um, man, I think, I guess trends that I'd like to see. <laughs> yeah. Um, cause I, I don't know if I have the, the fine finger on exactly what, what's going to happen. I think we know AI is going to have an effect. I think as yeah. people head direct booking, I think we are going to look, I think more and more hospitality brands are, are going to look at direct consumer. They're going to look at Shopify and what you do to engage guests on a one-to-one, one size fits one type of idea versus relying so much on OTAs and all that. And I think as we move more and more into, you know, people are, the amount of commerce that is happening in reels and in TikTok, like direct sales of products, like understanding like it needs to live in the world that you're engaging with the guest in it is something that's I just know is, feels like and that if the consumer behavior for buying products is going to move that way on products, it's going to move it in else, else other ways as well. And eventually hospitality will catch up to that. Um, and I, I just like the idea or believe in the idea that if it's going to move into a more kind of social environment, like having that relationship with the guest is going to be way impactful. Um, so those are, those are things I do. So I think that's kind of what allows us kind of be in this forefront of this idea of direct booking, direct, con- direct consumer. I mean, I'm still going to call it essentially direct consumer is utilizing the technologies that, or, or systems or ideas around loyalty and membership and community and rebooking and all of those things that have been that direct consumer has been doing for a while now starting to kind of move over and we're going to see brands and hospitality that looking at more direct consumer brands that how, how do they grow so fast and how were they, how they get, you know, the amount of orders they did in one day and how they did that. Um, that's what I, at least that's what I'm looking at still. It's exciting stuff, man. I'm really uh, excited to see what you uh, and, and your team build there. Where can people go to learn more about or follow you and your work and also learn more about Bolt Farm Treehouse? Uh, Bull Farm Treehouse, I mean, we have 420-something thousand on Instagram. So if we want to see the beautiful Cloud9 shots that we talk about, um, they're all over the place there. Um, and when you DM us or engage with us, you're going to get us. Um, we, we talk about all the time that hospitality for us starts in the DMs. It doesn't start when the sellers show up on the property. So that's that's the easiest, obviously, to book. We, we're 95 98% direct booking. Yeah, you can go to some of the OTAs and the... The VRBOs and the Airbnbs, but we like that engage. We like that direct booking relationship and the um, the easy ease of that. Um, so boltfarmtreehouse.com is our site there. Um, I'm LinkedIn. I, I it's been me personally. Like direct consumer is very Twitter, and, and and hospitality is not. <laughs> and so for me, starting to gauge, and I guess I, LinkedIn is where hospitality people live. Um, you know, but I, I've been loving engaging this community. Um, and people in the world of hospitality is because I'm learning so much and there are great people in this industry that are wanting to share about how they're building, what they're doing. And that I just find it so interesting. Um, but I mean, I, I generally find myself still on Twitter and talking to my direct consumer people. Um, so <laughs> you can learn, you can learn from anywhere, right? Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you for joining us here today, Nathan. I really learned a lot from you. I enjoyed our conversation. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. No, I appreciate it. Thank you.